Hi, my name is Yasmin Terehi, and this is Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one conversations with leading experts in wellness and spirituality. Today's episode is about a new approach to mental health with holistic psychiatrist Ellen Vora, an MD graduate from Columbia University Medical School. She received her BA in English from Yale University, and she's a board-certified psychiatrist, medical acupuncturist, and yoga teacher. Dr. Vora takes a functional medicine approach to mental health, considering the whole person and addressing imbalance at the root rather than reflexively prescribing medication. In addition to her private practice, Dr. Vora is also a writer, speaker, and a consultant for healthcare startups. So thank you so much for joining us today, Ellen. Uh, or should I call you Dr. Vora, whichever you prefer? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely call me Ellen. Yes, Dean. Thanks for having me here. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your for your time today. Um, so can you tell us uh, what exactly holistic psychiatry is? Uh, I know it's a new term, I think, for a lot of people. Uh, really curious to hear how you define it and what it means. Yeah, I think I'm figuring that out a little bit more every day myself. But <laughs> the way I think about it is I'm like a weird psychiatrist. Like I started out like a normal psychiatrist <laughs> going through med school and psychiatry residency, although I was never really normal. But <laughs> I sort of played <laughs> along with it. And then now when I I was always so disenchanted with the way I was taught to address mental health. Someone would come into my office, they'd tell me their symptoms. I was meant to translate that into a diagnosis and translate a diagnosis into a medication. And often one medication would become a cocktail of medications. And this never felt good to me. I didn't feel like I was really helping people thrive. I felt like I was helping people get um, their, their symptoms were managed. They were less symptomatic, but they were not necessarily like really flying and going off to live their most fulfilling lives. And I just started studying all these other modalities and disciplines and ways of thinking about health and healing and the human body. I found myself much more compelled by more Eastern modalities and how they think about health. So I studied Chinese medicine and acupuncture and a little bit of Ayurveda and nutrition and functional medicine. And now with all of these different tools, basically I meet somebody and I think really holistically about everything that's going on in their life. What are their, you know, not just their mental health or their family history, but also how are they sleeping and what are they eating and how's their digestion and how are their relationships and the quality of their work and do they have connection to meaning or purpose or spirituality? To me, all of these are determinants of mental health. And that's that's the holistic approach. It's basically to be weird and very <laughs> global about how I'm thinking about how does somebody feel well or out of balance. Amazing. And what kind of patient usually comes to you for help? Yeah. I mean, in a way, I think that there's a type, but it turns out there really isn't. So it's a delusion in my mind. I, I think that it's like women <laughs> in their 20s and 30s who are struggling with anxiety and depression and PCOS and things like that. That's like in my mind what I specialize in. But in reality, my practice is anything but that. You know, I have a handful of women who who sort of ma- match that demographic. But um, I, I'm at this point such a witch that I think that whoever ends up in my practice, like there was a little bit of a karmic connection or some kind of divine timing of how it all unfolds. But Um, My practice is really, it's really, really varied. It's people that struggle in all kinds of different ways. Um, And I think it's a little bit like I have something to offer them and they have something to offer me and my learning and growth. And that's why we come together. But yeah, depression, anxiety, insomnia, ADHD, bipolar, um, autoimmune disease is a big part of my practice. It runs the gamut. And, And so, you know, how do you, I'm sort of curious, like when a patient walks in, how do you assess, you know, what to do with them from a holistic perspective? You mentioned a couple of things when you define holistic psychiatry, um, but, you know, because we have such a plethora of mental health issues right now in our country, I, I'm, I'm just curious, you know, how you, how you look at, at the, you know, entire person and, and how much time you spend with them. Because I think from my understanding, uh, regular psych- psychiatry, I guess, is that what you call it? Regular psychiatry? Um, <laughs> conventional, yeah. Conventional, <laughs> conventional psychiatry um, just focuses on the issue and not necessarily the holistic perspective like you bring. So um, yeah, so I'm just curious, you know, is, is there a, an additional time component to it? Um, you know, how do you, how do you 
assess your patients when they come in for, for, um, and their issues? Yeah. So the way to assess for, um, issues on a holistic level, it just takes so much time. Cause basically when I meet somebody, I ask them like, tell me everything everything. And then (laughs) they think that they've covered everything. And then I ask them about all these other details about life. Um, and I think that that's, what's wrong with medicine right now is it, we've just commodified it and really, you know, kind of tried to create this assembly line or conveyor belt where it's like, you're not a doctor, you're a provider. And, um, you know, someone comes in, they have eight minute, minutes with you. It's basically perfectly designed to result in a prescription for a medication. It's mm. not perfectly designed to actually understand what's really going on deeply or do any kind of like, you know, this word, I guess is hokey at this point, but healing, it's sad that that's a hokey concept in healthcare, but you know, <laughs> there, there's not any room for like really holding space and a transfer of healing energy to a patient. So what I do is I take a lot of time with patients. My initial consultation is two hours and it's, it's never enough time and we always go over. So, um, I think that that's just what's really broken. And it, it, this ties into issues of privilege and making this kind of care accessible because, um, like right now you can get really crappy care, but it can be covered by insurance or to get care. That's like fundamentally going to fix the situation. It's often time is the commodity. And so it's more expensive and out of network and it's a whole mess. Um, I've tried to solve that by doing online groups. So I basically make my approach really accessible and affordable. Um, but it's different than one-on-one care. In some ways it's actually, there's something really beautiful about the community element. I think that's a really powerful dimension. Wow. Actually, can you tell us a little bit more about your group offerings? (laughs) I'm actually curious from my own network. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, basically my practice is now waitlisted until forever. And, (laughs) um, I could feel like this, I get, I don't know exactly how many emails per day, but a number of people reach out to me every day trying to establish care in my practice. Mm. And, you know, and I can tell like, it's people that really, really need a very niche, niche specific approach to care that I, I just know, like, there's just not a whole lot of people doing it this way. And so there's maybe a handful in the whole country. A lot of them are like me and their practice is full or they're very expensive. And so I just kind of kept feeling like every day I was, you know, saying no to 10 or 15 people. And I started to think, um, we've got like a big problem here. It's a tidal wave of need and it's an unmet need. And so I just thought if I open up to groups, then I can offer at least, you know, a version of this. It's not the same, but it's better than nothing. Um, and I can, you know, usually I'll have something like 10 to 20 people in my group every month. And so it's it's definitely accessing more people. And so, um, so that's what I do. And it's different every time. It's really fun. It's like, a group of us, we sit in Zoom together in gallery mode. That's a must. And then we <laughs> basically, um, I, you know, I cover a lot of ground of like, here are the basics, here are the fundamental approaches, like to take a holistic approach to managing mental health issues. Um, I'll answer people's questions directly, but we'll also do like weird experiential things. We'll shake and we'll dance and we'll hug each other and cry virtually. And it's just like the virtual, the crying is real, the hugging is virtual. And um, it's just like a very, very beautiful, very healing experience. And, um, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm moved to tears by it all the time. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And I think, you know, this year more than ever, I think people are really suffering. Um, there's just mental health. We're in a mental health crisis in my opinion, uh, globally. So Ellen, what are some interesting stories that you could tell me from patients who've gone through the holistic psychiatry process with you? Um, just curious if you could, maybe share some anecdotes or, um, stories from, from patients. Well, to me, like to every physician, really patient confidentiality is like super sacred. And so I, you know, I can speak generally. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Of course. Generally. (laughs) Um, I mean, something that's really fun in the way I approach this is that, um, often someone will come to me and they will have felt really chewed up and spit out by conventional psychiatry. Like they'll feel like they never really felt heard or listened to, um, or they felt like they were put on a med and then they got side effects and then they were put on another med and then one med stopped working and they increased the dose and they added another med and they just kind of felt like, how did this happen? Like, how did it come to this? That they're on so many different meds. They're very medicated. They feel kind of stuck. They don't feel well. 
Um, and then I'll also have a lot of people who come out of their conventional medical, like even their internist or primary care doctor, and they feel like very dismissed or invalidated. Um, I find that this particularly happens to women or particularly happens to anybody with anxiety where like there's just this wall that a lot of conventional practitioners put up and they sort of are like, that's just your anxiety. And they really shut down the conversation and someone just needs to feel really heard. It's like, yes, I might have anxiety and I have these physical symptoms or, and you know, this very real thing is going on right now. Um, so they're feeling, they're coming to me like really feeling strung out in that way. And it, to me, it's like such a privilege to get to give somebody, you know, a two hour initial consultation to let them talk uninterrupted for sometimes over an hour and just tell me their story and feel witnessed and heard and, and listened to and understood. And then often what happens is there's like two different ways to go through my practice. You can come in with a bunch of ailments and it turns out we really just needed to take a functional medicine approach and, and change your diet, heal your gut, you kind of this little Mr. Fix it things about how our physiology gets out of balance. And then it'll be like two or three sessions. Then someone will be like, thanks doc, peace. <laughs> and they fly like a bird out of the nest, you know? And then other people who I'm convinced like I have a much deeper karmic relationship to, or just a different karmic relationship to, they'll come into my practice and we'll do some Mr. Fix it stuff at the beginning. But actually what ends up happening is by getting somebody more on their path, we've really just opened up Pandora's box. And mm, then we, yeah. the practice, the treatment goes much deeper and it's like, okay, now someone's maybe less anxious, but now they're thinking about leaving their job or leaving their marriage or um, just like making a real 180 in terms of what path they were along when, start, when people start to realize that it wasn't exactly their truth, when they weren't fully hearing that little whisper voice inside. And once they start to hear that little whisper voice, it can bring up some really inconvenient truths and people can go in much bigger directions. So then we're on like a jungle cruise together and I'm just, <laughs> I'm in it for the long run with those patients. And we're, you know, it's, it's beautiful work. I have so many patients now who like their life is night and day of what it was wow. seven years ago when we started working together. Um, but the journey kind of, it deepens. Wow. Wow. Very interesting. Yeah. And it's, uh, what do they call it? The dark night of the soul. Um, when, mm. when, once you've hit rock bottom, you can only go up, but there's a long journey, right. That, that, um, like you said, when you open Pandora's box, uh, what happens afterwards is sometimes life-changing. Um, yeah. yeah. So Ellen, you have many tips for things like insomnia and OCD and other mental health issues on your Instagram account. Um, can you share some of the top tips for our audience when dealing with these types of issues? I think I just, you know, anecdotally can share uh, stories of people claiming massive insomnia in 2020 with the global pandemic and all these other things going on in the world. So, um, yeah, I'd love for you to share some tips for our audience if you if you don't mind. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, not, insomnia is my favorite thing to treat, and. Um, I could talk about it for over like well over an hour, but let me give you like the 10 <laughs> top 10 tips. Um, I do think light is really critical with sleep and that's the piece that a lot of us are getting wrong. My real overarching philosophy when it comes to managing sleep is that your body wants to sleep. It knows how to sleep, but there are aspects of modern life that are really getting in the way of our sleep and has a lot to do with our circadian rhythm. That's our sleep wake cycle and it is cued by light. And that was a foolproof system on the proverbial savanna of evolution when, um, like, you were by definition, like, if it was light out, it was daytime. And then if it was nighttime, it was dark. And that worked really well. So it cued the brain to have cortisol be the predominant hormone during the day. So we felt awake and alert. And then melatonin takes over once there's authentic darkness. And then that makes us feel tired and we sleep deeply. And it was a good design, but we just you know, we invented the light bulb and then things have kind of gone to shit since then, <laughs> but it's, you know, and I don't really regret, I mean, I think electricity is, is fantastic, but it's not good for sleep. So basically we have, um, all of these mixed messages in the evening, like our body knows that it's been a long time since it slept on some sense it's tired, but then it gets exposure to blue light from our phones and our screens and even ambient light pollution. And that gives a signal to our super chiasmatic nucleus in the brain. And that says, 
good morning, the sun is rising. And so like our brain cues the hormonal cascade that wakes us up. And that's great at 8 a.m. And it's really tricky at 11 p.m. And so that's why a lot of us are struggling with sleep. And you can get strategic about light. You can start to, um, you can put flux on your computer, which transitions your screen more orange and dim. You can use night mode or night shift mode on your phone. You can get blue blocking glasses, which are like my favorite kind of intervention because Mm -hmm. they're non-invasive inexpensive and really effective and the only thing that beats that is the squatty potty <laughs> in like that category <laughs> like non-invasive and expensive and it works but that's a different conversation but um but i think that orange glasses are wonderful and then um and then to just make sure that you're conscious about your choices around screens in the evening like that maybe there's a time 9 nine thirty, when you shut things down and then you transition into your bedroom and you kind of use blue block and glasses and read a backlit Kindle or maybe have a salt lamp or a candle or like all these hippie things that can make things more sort of circadian appropriate lighting in the evening. And then I think caffeine is a little bit of an underestimated like issue with sleep because it's hot. Like it's sexy and cool to drink strong coffee and to <laughs> love coffee and you know like that's badass but it just is we're also different in how we metabolize caffeine it has a long half life of about 5 to 7 hours so for some of us we're sensitive and if i have a coffee like at 3 p.m. it's not only i'm not going to sleep that night i'm not going to sleep for like the next couple of days <laughs> it's just like i'm sensitive to it and so if you're the person who can just have an espresso after dinner and still sleep that's great but if you're the person who has like a sip of coffee in the morning and then you're jittery and suddenly you're interrupting people in your zoom conference then like maybe you're <laughs> sensitive and you know it might behoove you to just decrease your overall caffeine consumption push it a little earlier in the day so it helps you sleep at night Um, blood sugar is my favorite under the radar issue. Um, when it comes to sleep, a lot of us are having middle of the night awakening due to blood sugar crashes. And so that's a nice one to fix. Um, the definitive solution is to actually just eat a blood sugar stabilizing diet. Um, but the hack is to do something like a spoonful of almond butter or coconut oil at bedtime. And also another one, if you wake up in the middle of the night, just to give you a safety net of blood sugar. And the reason that works is that when we have a blood sugar crash, our body goes into a stress response and that can really make our sleep superficial and we can wake up from it. And Mm. that's especially the case if you're someone who wakes up at like two or three or 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. and you're sort of in like a heart racing, little panicky feeling. That's to me a blood sugar issue until proven otherwise. Oh, wow. Interesting. What about for people that are doing intermittent fasting and not eating you know, after six, you, you reckon that's been, it's been interesting. That's been happening to a lot of people where they wake up in the middle of the night when they adjust their diet. Yeah. Yeah. So it might be that you're on like a ramp up phase where your body is acclimating to that new way of being sort of how it manages blood sugar. Um, and it might be that you're going a little too hard and fast for your body at that moment in that cycle. Like it's, we're also individual with this. I think mm. like a dude can really be liberal and play around with intermittent fasting. And there's a lot of benefits. I think women of reproductive age, it's a little bit more of a delicate art. And, mm. um, sometimes it means like building up more gradually, keeping a more blood sugar stabilizing diet during the day so that you're not as prone to blood sugar crashes overnight. Very interesting. Um, and what about, I mean, we, I feel like I have so many more questions about insomnia and I'm sure so many people would as well, but, um, I'm curious also about OCD, like things like anxiety. Uh, are there any other, are there any tips that you could share with the audience about Mm -hmm. stabilizing those? Yeah. OCD is an interesting one. Like anxiety, there's so much that we can all read about it. My go-to tips are there's a lot of overlap with sleep. Like I like people to reduce their caffeine when they're anxious. I like people to stabilize their blood sugar. Those two changes alone do away with so much unnecessary anxiety. Um, and then like sometimes people have to get off gluten. I hate to say it. (laughs) It's a whole (laughs) eye roll cliche issue, but it's true. And, um, and then I think a lot of us with anxiety, like we actually need to listen like deeply to what our body is trying to communicate to us with our anxiety. And sometimes it's telling us like, something's not right. Please take action about this. And so to really get quiet and still and listen to that and honor that OCD, there's not a lot of like, as far as as I can tell in my echo chamber, there's not a lot of people being like these five tips for your OCD. Um, And so I think it's a little bit of like an under, you know, saturated 
discussion right now. And I think that um, for me, at least, I think about OCD as an inflammatory state in the body. Um, I think of it as can be triggered by things like a strep infection, which is called PANDAS, um, sometimes even like certain medications, courses of antibiotics, um, stressors, of course, bouts of food poisoning, like any big dramatic shift to the gut flora or to our immune regulation. And then what you can see is this sort of like very inflamed brain and it manifests with OCD symptoms. So I like people to do a lot of things. I think gut healing is pretty critical in OCD. I do think blood sugar and caffeine still matter because it's like a physiology gone a little bit frenetic and you want to ground it a bit. And then um, I think that I like things like NAC, which stands for N-acetylcysteine, which is um, a really nice, affordable, safe supplement that can help. Um, it basically helps in a number of ways, but primarily detoxification. It's a precursor molecule to something called glutathione, which is our body's master antioxidant that we make endogenously in our liver. And a lot of us get very depleted of our glutathione just because modern life and all yeah. of the things that deplete us. And so boosting up our stores of glutathione by taking NAC can be really wonderful. I find it also just helps um, helps with digestive issues, especially like constipation. It seems to help with um, bipolar. Um, and I find that when I'm helping a patient get off of a psychiatric medication, like if they're tapering off, it's really helpful for that as well. So a lot of different inflammatory and kind of detoxification burden situations in the body, NAC can be a really nice support. Thank you. Yeah. I've heard about NAC now from a number of people. So I actually just bought it myself. Uh, it's been, it's Great. been on the radar for a while. Yes. Uh, so Ellen, what kind of things have surprised you in this journey? Ooh, I love that question. <laughs> um, hmm. I guess here's what comes to my mind. First of all, is that, um, like where I'm at now in my career, it feels good. I, I find my work incredibly rewarding. It's challenging, but it's really meaningful to me. And I'm writing a book and I just feel like I feel so in flow with purpose and with like carrying out kind of a dharma or like, here's what I think I'm here to do. And I think it's really important to point out that like I was such a, it was such a mess for so long. Like when I was in med school, there was no flow or dharma. Like I was like, shit. I felt I had a recurrent dream that I was stuck on a train speeding in the opposite direction of where I needed to go. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and I think in retrospect, I don't know, I didn't have a strong connection to my intuition at the time, but in retrospect, I do think I had an intuitive knowing that I had to stay the course and get through med school, get through residency so that I could carry out my purpose. But I think that um, what I've realized with patients is that we really need to ditch all the shoulds and all the conditioning and all the expectations and pressure that our families, our parents, the world, random people put on us or the things we do to impress people, the things we do that we think we should do. And the quicker we can just completely burn that to the ground, the better. And then what we do instead is we get really in an intimate dialogue with our inner, inner whisper voice. And we know what we're about. Like we've always known. And it's not like, um, it just doesn't have to be anything. It doesn't have to be impressive. It doesn't have to be prestigious. It doesn't have to be lucrative. It just has to be uniquely us, our authentic truth, what we're into, what we're passionate about, what we're uniquely good at. And if we can just be in that, in sort of the work we do or the work we don't do, you know, like whatever our life looks like when we're in that, I think that really makes the world go around more smoothly. And I think there's a lot less mental health issues when we are being with what we're really here to do. And I think one thing I see a lot of in my practice is people that are like, I don't know what I like. Mm -hmm. I don't know what my purpose or my passion is. And, um, I had a patient yesterday where it was very clear that she grew up in a really chaotic, difficult home. And she was the oldest of, um, a number of siblings. And she basically wasn't allowed to have needs. She wasn't allowed to have feelings. Basically she felt like she was barely holding up the foundation of this house. And if she caused a fuss, like the whole thing would collapse. And she felt a responsibility to look after her younger siblings and so on and so forth. So that's someone who like really went through much of her childhood, not able to just like 
have her own temper tantrum and be like, I know what I want. <laughs> and, and I think that in a way, like if you come to it late in life, like at least come to it late in life, but basically like have the temper tantrum now of being like, I know what I want. I know what I don't want. I know what my needs are. Um, I know what I like, and it can be hard to figure that out in adulthood, but not impossible. And to me, it's not negotiable, like carve out some time and space and get your, you know, sort of cheerleaders and support system around you and help them reflect back to you. Like you are going to get on your path and do what is important to you. So this is like a super long winded answer to what surprised me, but I guess what surprised me is that like mental health is many ways, just a symptom of our, our deeper knowing, just saying like something is not right here. And that can be physiologic or that can be that we're off our path. And sometimes it's a combination. Often it is. And so we just gently nudge ourselves back to balance physiologically. And then we really listen for what's our path and try our best to stay on it. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think so many people really are suffering from, from answering that question. So I imagine that uh, after many years of, of keeping quiet, that it leads to some type of mental health issues, right? There's a spiritual, emotional disconnection. So fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Ellen, you know, you you see so many patients. I'm curious if I know you, we talked about insomnia, we talked about OCD. What are you? What are some of the dominant themes that you've seen with your patients um, over the course of your practice? And then I'm also curious how that shifted during uh, quarantine and the pandemic in 2020. Mm, yeah, I would say the presiding theme has always been anxiety, and. Um, it's definitely gotten worse over the pandemic, but it's been different than I would have expected. At the beginning, I would check in with all my patients. Like at the beginning, this is March, 2020. And I would be like, just so gingerly like checking in and being like, are you okay? <laughs> and my patients were like, you know, actually I'm good. <laughs> like this is after, you know, years of treatment when they're really like crippled with anxiety. So there was this interesting initial phase where someone who had been anxious for years um, felt like almost a, like, dare I use the word relief, when it was almost like they had been holding on to this sense of dread or doom of like something is about to happen. And when something really happened, it felt vindicating. And it felt like now I have the answer to that question that was looming. So a lot of my patients felt like, oh, this is what it was. And now I know what it is and I can work with this. There's also a large segment of my patients who are pretty introverted and feel kind of fried by their daily lives. And so they, you know, found themselves no longer commuting, no longer interacting with um, difficult coworkers or, um, you know, the energy of the streets in New York. And they're just like holding out in a apartment somewhere deep in Brooklyn or in the Berkshires and they're feeling their nervous system is getting kind of um, a reset. And I'll say this and balance it with the fact that, you know, I'm fully aware that this is not just like the great pause for most of us. This is detrimental, you know, this is financially detrimental and, um, and certainly in terms of health and and death and loss and grief, like this is a you know devastation. Um, so I would say I had a handful of patients who were very anxious and came into this and actually felt better. And then I had more like the way I point to not my patients, but more like the social media community. And that's where I saw a huge uptick in anxiety and big existential dread and worries. And um, it's kind of, it really concerns me um, because things were already bad. I already felt like I was like, sticking my fingers in the holes in the dam and like trying to stop the leaks of like that, you know, everyone is overprescribed and physiologically dependent on benzos. And they're just these big problems that I've been fighting against, like feeling like this one woman army against these big tidal wave problems for years and years. And then, um, it kind of feels like hopeless right now. Like everything that I felt like we've been making little bits of progress on a population wide scale, like, there's just more alcohol consumption now. There's more benzodiazepine dependence now. There's more um, overprescribing of antidepressants now. There's more people that are feeling really anxious and depressed. There's people who are isolated. There are people who are home in unsafe environments. There are people that have been um, like comfort eating this whole time, which like I know personally, when you 
kind of get your body out of balance, it's really hard to get it back into balance. It's a lot easier to prevent it from getting out of balance in the first place. So we have a lot of, there's a lot to, to kind of like a mess to clean up after this. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Um, yeah, we were just talking uh, briefly about the forest fires in California. And I, you know, jokingly said, I think California has hit a, a new low <laughs> this week with, <laughs> with the pandemic and now the fires and natural disasters in general with uh, with the pandemic feels like a a pretty fascinating recipe of, you know, mail- what is it? Uh, just general destruction. Um, so yeah, I think people are really suffering and trying to figure out what to do with their their lives. Um, and also take care of their health at the same time. Um, so leading on to the next question, maybe you could share some of your keys to health and healing. Like what's your sort of words of advice to uh, our audience for maintaining their health? And maybe even we can um, edit it to talking about what what we, they can do during the pandemic, right? Because a lot of people don't have access mm-hmm. to gyms. They're working out from home. They're sitting at home. And like you mentioned, you know, people's health is getting um, out of whack. So people are, they've jokingly said they've had like COVID belly. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so yeah. The so COVID-15. The COVID-15. Yeah. I've, yeah, I've heard so many fun, funny memes about this, but also not funny, but, but I'm trying to have a sense of humor. It's a, Mm-hmm. It's the only thing I can do to keep myself <laughs> sane this year, just have a sense of humor. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe let's, I'll think about it from like two main angles. And one of them is the, like what I mentioned before is like Mr. Fix it. Like I love to go in and just workshop, like what are our habits that we just sort of unwittingly do that are really making us feel worse and be unwell. And I love to just go through a life with a fine tooth comb and be like, don't eat this, eat that. <laughs> install an air filter, install a water filter. You know, like I, I love to fix these things. Get get off of gluten, get off of dairy, quit sugar, quit alcohol, you know, as if it's so easy. Um, but I think that I do love to optimize in that way. Um, and so with that, yeah, in these times, like um, get an air filter, get a water filter. And with food, I think that just recognize that we're like, this is a marathon and not a sprint. And if we really just like sit on the couch and binge on ice cream, we will feel numb ish better for that 10 minutes, but then worse later. And I think that it's a radical act of self-love right now to feed ourselves food that serves our bodies. It's hard to do, especially because so much of the foods the world sell us, um, the world sells us is it's addictive. It behaves like a drug in our body. And so when we're feeling strung out and anxious and lonely and scared, um, and everything's uncertain, we want to eat the drug like foods, gluten, dairy, sugar, processed foods. Like, and so I get it. I do it too. But I think that we all feel worse afterward. So the more you can just get back to the fundamentals with food and eat real food and have your plate be a balance of well-sourced protein and starchy vegetables and a whole bunch of greens, all of it prepared liberally with healthy fats, that's a really good way to actually help us stay resilient and physiologically in balance through this. Um, but then there's like the whole other dimension of this, which I think is um, less about like diet and lifestyle and more about like, how do we hold ourselves through this? Like, how do we be a kind of a loving caretaker and cradle ourselves? And I do think that it's really important to give ourselves permission to feel all feelings. That's always important, but it's especially important right now while like our feelings might feel like a rodeo, like a wild rodeo of like different feelings. (laughs) You can feel anger and resentment and fear and panic and anxiety and rage and joy joy and grief and ecstasy like it can all be here and your job is really mainly just to not resist it like don't like no human emotion in the history of the world has ever been successfully pushed under the rug like just (laughs) feel it um because if you put it off like it just kind of gets harder later so just get it out of the way now and so feel our feelings feel them let it be big let it wash over us when we let our feelings hit us like a big tidal wave we think we'll never come up for air but it turns out that's how we let it truly resolve and it gets metabolized and have some practice for discharging stress. And that can be yoga or exercise or dancing or shaking or really just anything that really helps your pot, your body purge and control alt delete when we're taking on a lot of stress. And then I think doing less, 
Um, it's interesting. It's kind of part and parcel with the pandemic because we're all are doing less, but then we're just sort of, sort of doing like a different way of being busy. Um, we used to run around and be overscheduled and travel too much and go to too many networking things and run around, you know, we did <laughs> yeah. all that and that was crazy. And then now we're just like, I don't know, like on social media and Netflix, you know, it's, <laughs> like a, it's even worse. <laughs> and so I think that in a way, um, like we just need this yin yang, like this 50, 50 of when we're young and when we're active and productive and engaged and like do that, be in that, like really feel industrious. And like, we're making our contribution to the world, but balance that with 50% of a fiercely protected state of rest and rest is not Netflix and it's not social media. That's distraction. Um, rest is you take a barefoot walk in your backyard and just like walk a little around a little bit and whistle and hear the rustling leaves. Um, it can be putting on music and staring at the wall. It can be connecting with a friend, but like basically unplugged, ideally with some degree of nature. And that that is like a prominent part of your schedule is that you do things like that as well. And so I think, yeah, you like eat well and, and try to avoid the things that are just going to lift you high and drop you lower the next day or the next hour, like sugar and alcohol. And then um, give yourself space because we are going through a bit of a collective trauma and we need to process it. And we do that in spacious moments. Yeah, absolutely. I've, uh, I've thought that, you know, so many of us are probably gonna have to spend 2021 just processing 2020, you know, because yeah. there's so much to take in and, uh, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot, even for, for folks who are meditating every day. I mean, it's, it's quite a lot. So thank you. And Ellen, are there any books or resources that you can recommend to our audience? Um, and maybe books that have also helped you in your path, um, but just ones that you really think would be, um, you know, fascinating reads for our audience on the health and wellness and holistic psychiatry journey. Ooh, okay. I will try to keep this to fewer than 50 recommendations. <laughs> um, let's see. I think that I'm right now reading the power of now and I do love it. It is as good as people say. Um, I learned originally like my original hero and mentor in this space was Chris Kresser and his books, the paleo cure and unconventional medicine are both great. My colleague Kelly Brogan has two books, um, a mind of your own and own yourself, which are great. I think everybody needs to read all of Brene Brown. I think most of us, if not all of us, need to read Glennon Doyle, especially her most recent book, Untamed. Um, I love Untethered Soul um, by Michael Singer. Um, and then anything by John Kabat-Zinn and Thich Nhat Hanh um, as like a really good education and mindfulness. Um, that's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I've read about half those books, but we'll have to uh we'll have to do a book a book exchange list or something because yeah. Yeah, I um uh Brené Brown, Glennon Doyle and um The End, Untethered Soul was really really fascinating for me. Um uh, that one was kind of my first, I think my gateway to spirituality. It is so. such a gateway drug that book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even you know, for people who are just hardcore atheists and you know, hardcore science-based uh, uh, folks, the Untethered Soul feels like a good start. So I always give them that book. And for anyone in the mental health space, actually, one last recommendation yes. is that um, if you are sort of plugged into the mental health world, I think Anatomy of an Epidemic by Robert Whitaker is also a really important read. Great. And how can the audience find doctors like you. I mean, I know you, you've got a waiting list now until forever, as you mentioned. Um, and these, these group uh, courses that you, or the gr group offerings are pretty full, but I'm, I'm curious, you know, uh, where can people find people like you who practice this philosophy? What would be your words of advice for, for folks? Yeah, I would say like, we're in a funny moment where it's probably good to step out of the ivory tower of like heavily credentialed people. Um, I think it's rare to find someone who made it all the way through, like becoming an MD who can have enough like original thinking, um, an open-minded approach to really meet the like challenges of modern life. I think that we just get too entrenched in how to medicate and sort of surgery everything. And it's tough to like really be broad and nimble and ever changing. And when you come with that, so I think like basically look for it's, look for people like naturopaths, um, and 
um, and osteopaths and I think like functional medicine practitioners, but basically someone who's thinking holistically, who's taking more of a root cause resolution approach. And then at the end of the day, it's word of mouth and chemistry. But like Instagram is sort of an interesting wild ball breast where a lot of like, I think cutting edge medical, like to me, I'm learning more from my like Instagram, uh, I don't know, aspirational, like sort of colleagues than I do even from like, you know, it's like, that's, that's where it's happening. That's where people are thinking originally and thinking really smartly and taking very different approaches to health. So you can just yeah. like follow a couple of us on Instagram and it'll, you know, Instagram will suggest all the others. <laughs> so you'll, like, <laughs> yeah. you'll realize like, it's very eye opening and you see that it's not all MDs. Some of them are, but it's a lot of people who that's the like, MDs don't have a monopoly on how to think intelligently about the human body. And if anything, sometimes it holds us back. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So Ellen Vora on Instagram, for those of you who, uh, are on Instagram, follow her because she has a lot of really great tips that I also checked out <laughs> before this podcast. So, um, can you tell us actually a little bit about yourself now that you've talked a lot about your practice and we've learned a lot about, uh, you know, health from your perspective. I'm just curious, like how did Ellen Vora become Ellen Vora? What, what, um, you know, what motivated you to pursue this path? And yeah, how did you get here? Hmm. I mean, it's always like messy, you know, I think that I was always, um, this is like ties back into like, to just know yourself and your passions. Like in retrospect, it was always obvious that I was going to do something that looks exactly like this, but I never knew it at the time. I was always <laughs> just like, what the hell am I going to do? <laughs> like, who am I? Why, why, how does this all make sense? But, um, but yeah, I mean, I was somebody who was into the brain and into, like, I was an English major. I liked the human condition. I liked psychology. And then I was a really disenchanted, miserable med student and a really disenchanted, <laughs> miserable psychiatry resident. But then I found, like, a glimmer of light in, like, yoga was my lifeline and studying like I got, I did these electives and, you know, I started spending my free time going and studying Chinese medicine and acupuncture and Ayurveda and, and nutrition. And like, I would go to these more holistic modalities and I felt so like such a huge yes in my body. And whereas my body was like saying no in my lectures in med school, it was just saying yes in acupuncture. And so um, I just kept kind of one foot in front of the other pursuing what felt like a yes. And I did not realize where it was headed. And I very much had like angst about where it was headed. <laughs> I was like, this is not all going to come together. Um, and I was really worried, but it turns out if you just kind of follow, like, I do believe that whatever it is, like our intuition, some deep inner knowing, quote unquote, like I roll the universe, like something helps us know, go this way, don't go that way. And if we get quiet and still enough to hear that and listen and then do what it says, we never go wrong, even if it's really unclear where this is heading. And so I kind of finally just figured out how to listen to that voice and to go where it said yes. And it's a really fun practice. Like that's my compass. And sometimes it looks completely irrational, but it feels very good to me to just sit with a decision and, and check in with my body and see if my body contracts and feels cold and tense and I get sweaty and my stomach clenches. That's a no. <laughs> or if my body says like, um, I feel warm and expansive and released and tension is lifted and my body's just singing, then that's a yes. And um, I really try to use that as like a, that's my framework for making decisions now. And it, it doesn't lead me astray. And so I guess that's the answer is that eventually I figured out how to just listen to that. And then it kept taking me on a circuitous path, but a circuitous path that seemed to keep heading me in directions that led to more meaning and more fulfilling. Um, like just my life was more fulfilling. Mm, yeah, that's powerful. I think moving towards uh, expansion and walking away from contraction is a really powerful uh, framework for people. And I think it's funny uh, for people that don't know what that means. That's like sort of a sign of, of being out of touch with oneself too, like a sign of numbness where if you can't really tell what's going on within, you know, it's really hard to make decisions. So, um, yeah. and there's no blame there. Like it's our world sort yeah. of designed so that we are not in touch with ourselves, <laughs> but we can <laughs> yeah. reclaim that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so Ellen, can you tell our audience where they can find more information about you? 
Sure. Yeah. So I'm, I'm all over. Um, I'm on Instagram at Ellen Vora MD and then that's the same handle for Twitter and even TikTok and then, um, and Facebook. And then I, my website, ellenvora.com has a lot of resources and, um, all these handouts I like made 10 years ago, but I think they're still pretty useful. <laughs> well, Ellen, uh, thank you so much for your time. This was fascinating. I have so many more questions that I want to ask you. So, um, but I'll leave that maybe for another conversation. We'll have you back on the show another time where we can dig a little bit deeper into some of the, um, you know, uh, earlier questions, but I, I thought this was fascinating. I think a lot of people will find it very useful for how they want to spend the rest of 2020 and the rest of the year. So thank you so much for your time. This was very great and enlightening conversation. Yasmin, thank you so much. Wonderful. Well, for our audience, thanks for joining and for listening. In this episode, we learned about a new approach to wellness and mental health with holistic psychiatry with Ellen Vora. Tune in to Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one -on -one conversations with leading experts in wellness and spirituality.